as we're going to the feature part of this morning's program, I wanted to share a short poem with you by Clarabelle Allegria. Summing up, in the 63 years I have lived, some instants are electric. The happiness of my feet jumping puddles, six hours in Machu Picchu, the buzzing of the telephone while awaiting my mother's death, the 10 minutes it took to lose my virginity, the hoarse voice announcing the assassination of Archbishop Romero, 15 minutes in Delft, the first wail of my daughter, I don't know how many years yearning for the liberation of my people, certain immortal deaths, the eyes of that starving child, your eyes bathing me in love, one forget-me-not afternoon, and in this rainy hour, the desire to mold myself into a verse, a cry, a fleck of foam. Today's features all share the common path of great writers of power and wisdom in the words of their poetry and song, and I'm honored to have them as our special guest today. I'd like to begin with Gertrude Halstead. Gertrude comes from Worcester, Massachusetts, and is known and respected by many in the poetry world and as a true powerhouse of words and deeds. She grew up in Germany and spent her childhood days in her favorite pastime exploring the countryside with her dog Wutan. She fled to France in her teen years during World War II and was interned there in the south of France and moved over to the United States on a ship by the name of Excalibur in 1941. In the United States, Gertrude studied and worked as a preschool teacher and a social worker providing counseling services to children and families. She began writing later in her 50s, and 40 or so years later, not only does she write, she has three books of her poetry, and some are here today, and her first book of poetry, Memories Like Burrs, published in 2006, has been nominated twice for the Pushcart Prize. She's a recipient of the Worcester Council, Cultural Council Award and the Outstanding Achievement Award in Poetry from UMass Dartmouth and awarded the title of Poet Laureate for the City of Worcester in 2008. Gertrude stated that she enjoys sharing her poetry out loud and attempting to connect with her listeners through language. She described her source of inspiration for her poems as being about anything, anything visual, feelings, anything inspires me. I have no limit. And when asked if she is currently working on a poem, Gertrude replied, I always have something brewing. I'm thrilled and honored to have Gertrude come out to share her power of words and life with us today. Please help me welcome Gertrude Halstead. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I can't see anyone this way, I can see you. <laughs> um, and good morning. And thank you for inviting me. Can I put this here? I begin. with the title, by the way, of one of my books. Memories like burrs, thistles cling, embedded become part of the hem. Memories like burrs, thistles cling, become embedded become part of the hem. And it's really a beautiful day out there. And I feel like kite flying. If you'd like to come with me, you are invited. 
My kite is blue. Its yellow eyes dart space, daring me to let go. I repeat, my kite is blue. Its yellow eyes dart space, daring me to let go. And uh, I continue with a poem that I wrote after I experienced flood flood at age eight. Flash flood, age eight. It is the earth trembling, water rising, and the wind. Don't look, they said, at the fast flowing river, carrying rocks, bits of furniture, trees. Don't look, they said, at the swollen white belly of the cow, her wet back brown as the roiled water. Don't look, they said, at the first coffin, the second smaller one, the four black horses in perfect step. And the next one was inspired by a picture I saw of a little boy, very sad looking, who was holding, I don't know if you can see it, you can look at it afterwards. The boy, the boy who identifies with fish, he always trusted water, how it rocked, carried him. At five, his father made him hold fish by their lips in front of the family car. Later, small, lightweight, strong lungs crossing the long school pool, back and forth, back and forth. Without surfacing, he loves the underwater more. He identifies with fish. That morning, the first day of summer vacation, he runs to the pond and is under the surface, smooth over him. He crosses back and forth, back and forth. On the way back, a gentle splash, barely a splash, a sting, a pain, barely a pain. He feels pulled, his mouth, lip, struggle, free. He identifies with fish. From the bridge, I watched a leaf, yellow, oval, first float, then swirl in the rain-swollen brook. The current took it down, stream, around trees, over rocks, tumble into a still pond. And it is these birches, tall, elegant trunks, limbs shaking, every leaf a tremble, confronting, defying, the approaching, threatening storm. And that fear Fear knows no seasons. What was it that scared you when small? Scares you now, dreaming. Left locked in the garden shed. 
Fog, coming night, incoming tide, the rush of rolling water rising, booted footsteps at the door, the shrill of sirens, bombs dropping, silence. By night, the sight of rats eyes to eyes, the deep piercing barbs of wire. I call it painting, but I paint with words. On the back of this old white color shirt, I paint, I should uh, say first, I lived in Paris at that time. On the back of this old white color shirt, I paint nightmares in the sun exploding cathedral windows, in the light, always the light, pattern on the stones at Saint-Chapelle. I paint black boots and books burning. I paint you blind because you would tell them nothing. I paint you free, falling from that high window ledge before they kicked your door in. I paint trenches. I paint the charred ribcage of my father's house. I paint the dead ash gray, and the light, always the light. And, by the way, I should let you know, I knew the two people that I mentioned. One was the head of the refugee organization in Paris, a friend, and she was the mother of a school friend from long ago. <clears throat> and this is a postcard, I call it postcard from Paris. And it was John Arjun that brought it back to me. And I cherish it. Postcard from Paris. Under these roofs, we once felt sheltered. Under these roofs, we were there, held hands, watched moons set, suns rise. On this river, we took boat rides. Along this river, we crossed bridges, walked, rested, read books, until once more black boots shattered, sirens, bombs scattered all, all never again under the same roof. And you can look at the postcard afterwards. <clears throat> I used to do some painting uh, with gouache paint. Wax crayons on bristle board or wood. Gouache paint on wet, torn cotton sheet. Back of old shirt. Fragments from the past, the present. Late night poems I paint. I call it lunch after Picasso. I had been at the museum and uh, had a cup of coffee afterwards. Blue iris, 
yellow velvet lipped, sips at my table. We toast Picasso periods, I coffee, she water, we part nodding. <clears throat> And uh, during the war, uh, the people that were not French-born were interned at a camp, at various camps. I was sent to the south of France, uh, near the Pyrenees, and uh, you could see the foothills. And I wrote gifts, long fingers of the sun, touch peaks, foothills, color all lavender, Flowers, rocks, falling water later turns the palest pink, and at dusk, boulders become wild goats descending. My hands against barbed wire. I wrote this remembering in my childhood when I was taken to the circus and I was very sad to see the animals, the panther, the lion, pace back and forth behind the bars. And I wrote panther, leopard in the black color face, the day hot, I slept. The night moonless, I left the den to hunt that black night. And I, as black as night, why that night, that black night, as black as that night, and I, as black as that moonless night, caught that night. Why that night of my hunt, I, the hunter, hunted, caught. Behind bars, that black night, and eyes all day, that black night, and eyes all day, eyes between bars, and eyes behind bars, cold bars, bare bars, bare as tree trunks, yet not tree trunks, no more trees, no more forest, only bars, back and forth, forest of bars back and forth, right and left, nothing left, nothing right, round and round, walls in back, bars in front, forest of bars, no more forest, no more trees, only walls, bars, eyes, I, I, I. Uh, time for another kite poem. Remember, letter to a small kite. Remember, this is not necessarily the last flight. This time, I left you at home. I knew there would be no wind, nothing to lift you up, to let you be airborne. For now, stay, close your eyes, relax, Think back, remember, fold it into your transparent sack, your eyes closed, focus high on your forehead, the white center. Relax, breathe deep within, now exhale, your string slack. Feel the left side of your face relax. Think back, remember, when you first learned to fly, to skywrite your name, how difficult, how very difficult it was then. Remember, when the time comes, 
This is not necessarily the last flight. Remember, when the wind comes, the wind rushes, pushes you into the thorn bush, the fence, the tree branch, the burning, the bright light. Remember, when the time comes, this is not necessarily the last flight. And uh, I wrote a poem for my children when they were young and were raking leaves in the fall. I call it October Children. Fool's gold and copper red leaves for the raking lie. Full arms they gather, no weight at all, windswept laughing in their fall. And a yellow leaf. It is late afternoon. Walking, I look down, half covered under my left foot, a yellow mitten leaf, a child's barely, brown edged where small fingers fit, a lemon yellow palm, the wrist still green, the supple stem a vibrant red. I left it there to its own aging. This deals with aging and Alzheimer's. In time, we will walk back in our own footsteps. Come dusk, the door wide open. She sits on the edge of her bed, faces the dresser mirror, wonders who she is and where. Come dusk, he looks for his wife, long dead, enters other rooms, other beds. Come dusk, she paces, holds a torn phone book tight under her arm, tries to find friends between the pages. Come dusk, we walk back, we walk back. Another kite poem. You have grown, I call it promise, you have grown impatient on the back seat, car windows wide open. I can hear in your minor wings string strains. Wait until the day I wish for wind to guide you safely past cumulus, past nimbus, past stratus, past cirrus. Free of this world, below you I hold the empty spool. And the last one, I hope I didn't go too far over my time. I hope not. It's about the state of the world. Try to praise the mutilated world. Remember summer's long days, wild raspberries, drops of wine, the dew. Remember the nettles that overgrew the abandoned farms of exiles. You have seen the refugees heading nowhere. Remember the music of Bach when we were together, fall leaves scattered over the earth's scars. Remember we gathered mushrooms and the grey feather a thrush lost. Try to praise the mutilated world and the light that vanishes and returns. Thank you. I would just like to add two important facts uh, that I didn't mention in Gertrude's introduction as uh, you likely know that Gertrude uh, is a Holocaust survivor 
and that she is 92 years old this year. And in starting writing at age 50 and always having something brewing of great inspiration to all of us and a joy to speak with on the phone in learning more about her life and a great honor, Gertrude, to have you come in and to hear your voice, share your poetry, which I've read, and to share words of great human challenge as well as celebration of the beauty of life also. Uh, once more, to thank Gertrude Halstead. We are moving on to John Swenson, and I'd like to say a few words about John, who comes to us from Pennsylvania. He is a native of Massachusetts and born in Andover. When he was three years old, he started to sing in front of others and found singing his songs in front of an audience uh, a very pleasurable event and just kept right on going, got hooked. Uh, was the phrase on that. As a child, he divided his time between roaming the woods of his neighborhood and being a voracious reader. He was given a ukulele at the age of nine, and which he admits had led to his reputation in being known as a folk singer-songwriter who plays the tenor guitar. As a teen, he began songwriting. And John mentioned that one of uh, the jobs of greatest inspiration to him was in college as a journalist intern. John says, I wound up writing for a small African-American community paper in Roxbury. Old timers will remember the times were tumultuous throughout the country, and Boston was no different as it was dealing with de facto segregation in local schools. My eyes, my heart, and my soul were opened and changed forever. John worked a number of other jobs while writing over six, 600 songs and performing them throughout his life. More recently, he's been retired and not long ago traveling the roads of the United States, about 10,000 miles worth. And one of the songs that he came up with during his travels was Lady Greyhound, based on a woman he met in Washington State who he met in a cafe but lived in a converted Greyhound bus. I asked John about some of the best moments in sharing his songs, and he stated, when anyone is moved to cry or laugh appropriately, I feel I've done my job. When someone says, thank you for writing that song, I am both honored and humbled. When someone says I got my point across, but they didn't feel preached to, then I'm happy, because as much as I want to say things through my songs, I never want to be thought of as trying to sway a person to my way of thinking. Who am I, anyway? As another of my songs says, I just try to make you think I don't ask you to believe. John, I'm a believer. And I look forward to your songs that you have to share with all of us this morning. Help me welcome John Swenson. Well, good morning. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, I forgot I told you all that stuff. Anyway. <laughs> um, it is an honor to be here. Uh, especially uh, today with these two distinguished poets. Uh, I've gotten a brief uh, chance to talk with each of them, and uh, if you have a chance afterwards, those of you who are here, uh, try, to, try to get a few minutes to talk to them. They're great people. And speaking of honor, <clears throat> um, this past Wednesday, I have to say that I'm honored to have shared my 43rd anniversary with my beautiful wife, Janice. Thank you. Who has uh, put up with me in this music thing for <laughs> her whole life. <laughs> her whole life with me. And uh, this, this song I wrote uh, for her, uh, it's about all the times that I have been out late and she's had to go to bed alone. And uh, it's called Soup in the Kitchen. From folk to rock and back to folk, the music came before I spoke. Singing is the very first of my first memories It's been a friend since my beginning And I think it had a part in winning the luck of a lifetime woman Who just seems to want to please And there is soup in the kitchen There is butter, there is bread And a note that 
says, I love you when you're ready, come to bed. And I think about my music, how my life had gone along. And I know I couldn't do it if she wasn't in my song. So here I am another day, just passing time to I can play, watching her, just watching me as I work on a song. And later on she'll come and kiss me, she'll tell me just how much she'll miss me, but I know that she'll be with me even when she's not alone. And there'll be soup in the kitchen, there'll be butter, there'll be and a note that says, I love you when you're ready, come to bed. And I think about my music, how the night had gone along. And I know I couldn't do it if she wasn't in my song. And knowing that she knows me better than I know myself, keeps me from place where I become somebody else and so I pick up my guitar I'm on my way up. I'm no star singing with my heart and soul the things that life has done and it's so good when people get me if they don't okay it won't upset because I know I'm heading home to that sweet audience of one and there'll be soup in the kitchen, there'll be butter, there'll be bread. And a note that says, I love you when you're ready, come to bed. And I think about my music, how the night had gone along. And I know I couldn't do it if she wasn't in my song. Yeah, I know I couldn't. If she wasn't in my song. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
It's the shadowy dark thinking I want to tame But I can't seem to go where unconsciousness streams When my eyes open, my dreams lose their life And I never know where my mind traveled that night Cause at the edge of remember They drop out of sight It's like one hand not knowing What the other is doing It's most disconcerting It's Jekyll and Hyde It's a door that has promise That waits to be opened But I lost the damn key And I can't get inside But why should I worry I've lived long without it It's really just lately It's under my skin So I'll just forget it Yeah, I wish, but I doubt it Hey, I must be dreaming Again When my eyes open My dreams lose their life And I never know where my mind traveled that night Cause at the edge of remember The dreams drop out of sight At the edge of remember mm. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> well, this is a time, as someone mentioned earlier, I think Cheryl, we have a lot of trouble in the world. And uh, we look for heroes. You know, we're always looking for some kind of hero. I'm not talking about like Superman or somebody like that. But uh, I think we need real kind of folky heroes. And uh, this is a guy that I, that I kind of like uh, think is a hero of a different kind. You all know him. He was considered a bumbler and a fool in many ways. But uh, in the end, he really knew how to get to the heart of people. This song's about the Wizard of Oz. Like that scarecrow in the movie Think I need a brand new brain The one that came here with me isn't working quite the same I can't remember words like See, there I go again I hope that I'll recall the words I'm singing till the end I gotta find me that old rainbow And that road of yellow brick I think I gotta find them quick because, because, because There's one person that I know Could fix this scatterbrain scarecrow And I'm searching for a real-life Wizard of Oz There are times that I feel hollow like there's nothing left inside And my heart has disappeared With every tear that I have cried For war and hurt and hunger Patience wearing thin I fear the world is empty Like that storied man of tin I gotta find me that old rainbow find them quick because 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 there's one person I could meet could give this tin man's heart a beat and I'm searching for a real life wizard of Oz can I get to Emerald City can I walk over To try.
I don't have a lot of courage I have always lived in fear And that fear is getting stronger Every minute that I'm here There's more I could be saying More that I should do Sure, there are lions in the world But I'm thinking they're scared too I gotta find me that old rainbow And that road of yellow brick I think I gotta find them quick Because, because, because There's one person who just might Make this lion's courage right So I'm searching for a real life wizard of Oz I'm searching for a real life wizard of Oz I gotta find me that old rainbow Thanks very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Back, I think, in... I think it was early summer months. I'm not really sure now. Um... I watched a speech that Barack Obama, whatever your politics, that was a great speech, uh, in, uh, in Germany. And I took a phrase out of that. He talked about tearing down the walls. And he didn't mean just the walls, uh, the Berlin Wall that was torn down, but the walls of prejudice and hate and all the things we seem to have problems with now. And, uh, whoop. So I wrote this song called Tear Down the Walls. Shut me out I am your neighbor I am your brother I am your friend Look here in my eyes You see no danger We won't be strangers In the end Come take my hand Come and make a stand with me Hear the outcries, hear the calls, bring your heart, bring your soul and we'll break down the barriers, tear down the walls. I am like you, I'm from the heavens, we are the present, we have one name, look in the mirror, we seem different, but look beyond, we're just the same, come take my hand. Come and make a stand with me Hear the outcries Hear the calls Bring your heart Bring your soul And we'll break down the barriers Tear down the walls And we still bleed from the wounds of those before us We sing the chorus Of the only song they knew But wounds can heal And we can write a new song And sing the words so loud The walls will fall Don't shut me down I am the dreamer, I am the future, we can be one, there's no real reason, we can't be better, and walk together, when we're done, come take my hand, 
Come and take a stand with me Hear the outcries Hear the calls Bring your heart Bring your soul And we'll break down the barriers Tear down the walls Come take a stand Come and hold your hand with me Hear the outcries Hear the calls Bring your heart Bring your soul And we'll break down the barriers Tear down the walls Break down the barriers Tear down the walls Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And last of our features this morning, I would like to introduce John Hodgen, also of Worcester, who attends a poetry writing group with Gertrude for over 10 years, I understand. John grew up in Hubbardston, Massachusetts, where he claims he spent most of his childhood looking for the Lone Ranger's hideout, over 108 acres or so of his grandfather's rented land. He started writing poetry as a high school student and went on to study English in college and then teaching high school for about 30 years and then became a full-time teaching assistant, uh, I'm sorry, a full-time assistant professor of English at Assumption College in Worcester. Hodgen, John Hodgen admits to loving his work, teaching at the college level. And he also keeps quite busy with his own writing. He has his poetry published in many journals and has three books of his own po poetry published, all prize-winning books, with most recent book, Grace, that, which was awarded the 2005 AWP Donald Hall Prize in Poetry. John is also the recipient of another, a number of other awards, the Blue Stem Award, the Ruth Stone Poetry Prize, the Foley Poetry Prize from America Magazine, the 2006 Press Award for Best Original Poetry from the Catholic Press Association, among others. He has received a lot of honors for his writing. And so I was curious to ask John about one of his most memorable moments sharing all of his very powerful poetry. And he said, I was in the middle of reading my poetry at Harvard University once, and the janitor came in and began cleaning up while I was reading my poetry. And that was pretty funny, actually. I'm happy and honored to introduce a great poet of wisdom, honest, raw emotion, humor, and humble nature, Please help me welcome John Hodgen. Cheryl, Cheryl, that was a lovely introduction, and um, I really appreciate you and uh, the crew here, you folks getting up early to do this, and uh, you people in the audience who gave up your time to come, too. Uh, I think it's uh, an important thing to make that space available, um, to recognize that there is this place for art in the community, and there's this need to uh, to say the things that um, you don't get to hear on TV and uh, in your day-to-day. -day. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear Gertrude and John. I love your work, and I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I've got, I've got 600 poems, and <laughs> I'm going to read them all <laughs> very, very slowly. Um, <laughs> Um, I, sometimes your heart fills up. I, I just got back from uh, Kansas City, or, or as I refer to it, uh, the place that has my granddaughter. Um, and I love that kid. I, um, I want to read the poems that I'm writing that, that I haven't finished yet because I'm correcting papers. Um, my granddaughter is named Grace. Uh, the book is named Grace, and um, there are all kinds of reasons for that. But, I had the, um, the the sheer joy of of uh, spending some time with her. She's beginning to read, and and uh, she takes real pleasure in 
sounding out a, a, a word that, that you can see it crosses her face. You can see that joy when she gets it, you know. And, um, I'm such a sap. I, I'm walking around in the plaza in Kansas City. I, um, it was a beautiful, beautiful day. And um, came out of um, Barnes and & Noble. And, and um, just I looked across the street, and there was a store, the Guess Clothing Store. And it just had this big, big sign on the door that said Guess. And um, I like sitting on the street with her. I like sitting on the sidewalk with her. We, um, I think the happiest moment of my entire life also happened in, in um, Missouri. Um, when she was smaller, we, um, we sat on a sidewalk once that had a puddle in it, and we decided that it would be fun to start splashing in the puddle. <laughs> um, a little embarrassing when people start walking by and asking which one's the child uh, here. Um, Anyway, I saw this sign, the guess uh, sign, and I asked her to um, to guess what it said, and um, she sounded it out, and she said, guess. And I said, no, no, Gracie, no, no, I don't want to guess. You you have to guess. <laughs> and, then, and then she didn't realize she was being drawn into that Abbott and Costello, who's on first kind of um, madness. But we sat there for a good five minutes saying, guess, no, you guess, no, you guess. Um, it's, it's a wonderful town. Uh, there's a jazz museum and a black baseball hall of fame. And uh, I, I want to read the poems that I haven't written yet. I want to read the poems about the, the janitor, the, not the one from Harvard, but the janitor I saw in the, uh, the blue room, which is the uh, replica of a jazz club back in the day. I was, um, I was the only person in the Jazz Hall of Fame. I went on a Sunday at 4 in the afternoon, which is, I think, when museums um, really are museums. Nobody's there. Nobody's there at that time. Um, I looked into this jazz club, and there's this guy uh, with a mop and a bucket. And uh, No, oh, he was he was he was cleaning. He was just mopping up, and there was nobody there. You know, it was like he didn't have to, and uh, it was like he was every every jazz performer's uh, dream audience. You know, you look at a guy just cleaning up, and he was cleaning great. He was doing such a good job, and there was nobody there. And I was I was afraid he'd see me looking at him, and I, it just filled me with joy to uh, to see him doing that. That sacred thing, I guess, of doing his work when there was um, nobody looking or no need for it at all. He was doing it anyway. I've been thinking about my country, too, and um, you walk around in some parts of Kansas City, I'm always looking at stuff, and uh, they, have, they wear their poverty a little differently. You see all these people that just looked a little, a little desperate, a little, a little more aware that something's wrong, that something isn't quite the way it's supposed to be. So uh, middle-aged men just sitting in their cars on a Saturday morning, just sitting in their cars, and there was that desperation. That, and they weren't going anywhere. They were just sitting in their cars. It was like they were hiding and uh, afraid to go home. I've got a poem that um, asks you to take a bit of a leap here, if you don't mind. It's called Undiscovering America. And I'm going to take you back to fourth grade history class, if you will. Um, if you can remember all your explorers, all those folks that came over here uh, looking, just wide-eyed and looking for stuff. Um, so if you know your explorers, they're, they're in here. I'm going to uh, ask you to imagine that uh, the History Channel occasionally does this. They'll dress actors up as history folks and take a, a publicity shot. And uh, I'm going to ask you to imagine that they did that with all these explorers. Undiscovering America. Somewhere today, on some ethereal preserve, all the old explorers gather in Manhattan for one of those trendy group photo shoots, some meet and greet publicity tour for the History Channel. They clank onto a loading dock with their breastplates and swords their puffy pantaloons, their helmets curved like half-moons. They shake hands all around gruffly, line up alphabetically. Balboa pressing forward, Cabot saying cheese. 
Oh, good. <laughs> Columbus, of course. Coronado. Cortez. Dodgy de Soto. Vasco da Gama and old Ponce de Leon. Nervous Magellan in his arrow shirt. Thank you. Um, Black-hatted Father Marquette, his cellmate Joliet. Coon-skinned Zebulon Pike peeking out. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Pocahontas holding hands with John Smith. Sacagawea smiling like the Land of Lakes maiden between Lewis and Clark. And lonely Vespucci at the end of the row, mumbling to himself his mother's regrets. Amerigo, Amerigo. <laughs> After the shoot is over, Francisco Pizarro, the group spokesperson, announces that they are leaving America, all of them, going back, going home, sailing backwards down the Hudson for the Southeast Passage in their tall ships, the Golden Hind, Nina, Pinta, Santa Maria, past the Port Authority, the Statue of Liberty, past the Hamptons, past the Fountain of Youth, the Seven Lost Cities of Gold, past the Pathfinders and Explorers backed up on their way to the Mall, till their ships look like toy boats, toy boats, till their ships are so small, till they sit at the edge of the world, till they fall, saying, this is not what we were looking for. This is not it at all. Oh, thanks. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Um, Emily says, tell the truth, but tell it slant. And, and lately I've been, um, I've been seeing people uh, on the edge. The, I saw a guy in Kansas City, uh, an Asian man, all dressed up with a tie that was kind of badly tied. And, you know, one of those ones that's way too long and the other part's way too short. And he was coming out of church and he just started walking down the street and he looked more lost than ever. He, he just looked like he had um, completely lost where, where he was supposed to be. Um, anyway, I, I'm going to... I'm going to mess this up is what I'm going to do. Um, I got a friend who um, is in the workshop in uh, Cambridge, uh, and he just lost his wife and uh, teaches at MIT. He's a wonderful guy, and uh, he's just uh, struggling and really in denial. And uh, I started thinking about when, uh, when, sorrow, when sorrow comes to visit, when sorrow comes to live with us, when sorrow moves in. What, what that must be like. So I, I've laid an assignment on myself. If some of you write, I'm always doing that. I'll, I'll get an idea, and then I'll say, well, look, I'm going to make little challenges for myself. I, I need a, an ingredient here. So I, I said to myself, I'm going to have um, a pickup line. I'm going to have a, a sports reference. Um, I'm going to have a reference to the stars. And it, so you just set those little ingredients up as a way, as a way to kind of push yourself to write the thing that you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have tried to write in. You can always take them out if they don't work. But so I personified sorrow. I made I made sorrow into a woman that you might see in a bar. And you can steal this pickup line. It's a great pickup line. And it's just called sorrow. What else to do with sorrow but to buy her a drink? Walk it over to her table. Set it down in front of her. Sorrow is a woman, always has been, always will. And say the only pickup line you've ever heard that works. Drink this until I start to look handsome. <laughs> and she'll look down at the drink, then up at you slowly, then down at the drink again, and say in a voice that will make you feel that it's all right to keep drowning. It's going to take more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so you tell her you have, an ex you have extra tickets. Excuse me. You, you tell her you have an extra ticket to the game. And you know already that it's going to be a good one. A long fly ball in the bottom of the ninth. And surprisingly, she comes. And she knows her game, too. 
saying of the runner taking his lead off first that he has a mad case of the quicks. And you realize for the first time and with the finality that could be the basis for starting a religion that sorrow is smarter than you are, always has been, always will. And the best you can come back with is from basketball, that men who can dunk have mad ups. And still she comes home with you, stays for the night, standing barefoot on your lawn with you at 4.30 a.m., drinks in your hands, naming the stars, waiting for the birds to wake up so she can name them all, too. And you know she's moving in with you, that she'll want all new curtains, that you'll be known as Mr. Sorrow now, that you're starting to look handsome, that you've got a mad case of the slows, that she's yours now forever, always has been, always will. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. I found a lovely poem uh, by a poet named Mary Bushinger, and uh, I just wanted to read it to you this morning. It's from her chapbook, uh, Room Full of Sparrows. It's called Luck. Don't look too deeply into luck. The fewer questions, the better. Rather, consider it a dark pool, the possibility of fish and snails, wild irises, yellow swamp mallow along its shallow, crumbling edges. Squirrels dodge in and out of logs. A hawk circles interested, whistling, for this is how it is. We wake each day in our swallow nest of mud and grass, a cradle swinging from slender boughs above the pool beneath a changing sky. Mary Bushinger, uh, her poetry was found in, uh, I found it in Cambridge, and she teaches in uh, Boston College, I believe it is. But I just, I love this poem, so I wanted to share it with everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read a poem that I wrote about a painting of mine, which is on the cover uh, of my recently published book, uh, The Magic of Light. Uh, the uh, poem is called The Artist. Uh, I might uh, preface the poem by uh, quoting a line from Nietzsche, uh, the artist is he who dances in chains. The Artist. He watched as Polkar's coffee shop took shape, light becoming color in the store's green front, dark brown interior, and windows lined with goods under the red and white sign. Passersby stopping to watch behind the painter as the two old guys talking at the curb enter the picture, one seated in a lawn chair holding a parking spot there in Boston's north end, while a woman walks past and nears the corner, revealed in mid-step. Not like a photo, the man painting truth in blue shoes, Italy in hands, putting everything he knew into it. Sunlight rising through the day, up the front of stairs, across the street, Terramia's Restaurante's red banner flaming. He watched the man paint all day long. As the scene came to life, seeing the awful arrogance and self-contained splendor of the artist. We are on the eve of a national election, and I hope that everyone who is registered to vote will go out and vote for the candidate of your choice. Because if you don't, we might get an election result like this one. We had better things to do. In Dewdrop, Minnesota, the 23 voting residents created an electoral glitch without historical precedent. Longtime Mayor Tom Kelly was running unopposed and would have been a shoe-in 
even if he campaigned without clothes. But the naked truth was Mayor Kelly was not reelected because no one bothered to vote. A candidate was not selected. I don't understand it, said the befuddled mayor. A handful normally vote, but today no one was there. Everyone has a job, and the polls are 10 miles away with a high cost of gas. I guess people said, no way. I'm amazed, said Larry Crane, a steady voter in the town. You would think Mayor Kelly himself would have voted to keep his crown. The mayor was in meetings for the entire day and never got to the polls so his campaign could hold sway. It was a classic case of letting other people do it. But when there were so few voters, the now former mayor just blew it. Thank you. When the weather is nice, I like to hang the laundry out on the line. I live in a neighborhood where you can still do that in this country. The title of the poem is Laundry. I don't care how long the sheets hang on the line. The neighbor calls. Her daughter cannot sleep, sure that the thwacking of the cloth is the ogre from her bedtime story thumping on the wall. Her son huddles in the corner, the snapping on the line twigs broken by Jack's giant as he stumbles toward the house. Even the cat won't cross the backyard grass, scrambling instead under the bushes, staring at the noise. In another land far away, my father lies consigned to an iron bed, startled by the clanging of the sides as they slide up and down and up again, hearing voices in the hall. And he cannot sleep either, would prefer to retreat, to climb the beanstalk, to remember once upon a time. So the sheets whack the wind, tangle the line, choke each other in a crazy dance, and I don't care. Thank you. I think we've all had these moments, but I'm not sure whether in presenting this poem I'm talking about my own failings or whether this is perfection in a way that is the best that we as humans can, can do. It's called Poems Never Written. The poems you never write can be the best. These come to you on a run, while driving, during a hike in the woods, and they're wonderful. The initial idea clear, the message for others that transcends, the central text flows easily, each word fitting precisely with its peers, never the problem of disjointed phrase or hanging clause. Poetry perfection. In the ending, while never quite achieved, on the run or drive or hike, showing amazing promise of binding the work together and delivering the promised message. An amazing poem to be, but it doesn't happen. Perhaps it will later, but perhaps not. But there's still value in the message delivered, at least to the writer, and the spark of promise also delivered. Perhaps the poet needed the spark more than the poem. I spent all day Tuesday in Lowell with my students, and we got to experiment with water power. We got to uh, tour the mills and hear looms working, just incredible noise. We got to go on a canal boat ride, and then the next day, it was a wonderful day, and then the next day I woke up with absolutely no voice, <laughs> none, none. So it's very gradually coming back, but I kept thinking about this poem, which is in the, in the voice of somebody remembering his great-grandfather. It's called Llewellyn. My great-grandfather looked at these hills and saw wool, saw in the dusk of his heart a ghost child 
in blankets the colors of the sky. He spent his next 60 years with sheep and the troubles of sheep, foot rot, scab, and then the mill, combing 4,000 pounds of fleece its first year, and the weaving mills after, schedules and ledgers, and the faces of men to be gotten along with. And walking the vertical streets of this town with me in tow towards the end of his century, he still looked out over nothing at grass and downhill water. Power for the sheep, power for the mills, all of it a way to warm that child who would never be warm. Now I think of him, remember his hand on a blue merino overcoat on my shoulder. When I try to assess the captains of industry, the consistency of my own life, I think how a man's day and night cross and the weave holds. Um, this poem I feel th I had hoped was finished, and I, um, on the way over, changed it. During the break, changed it. So in this company of poets, I feel okay reading it, but um, it's a work in progress. It's um, for my brother-in-law, Dennis. It's called Prayer Cows. They didn't start as prayers. The first few times I drove the route to visit Lucille because Dennis was dying, I noticed the chestnut brown and white cows standing in the green field. As the weeks went by, the road became so familiar that the scenery blended. I looked for the cows as a marker, a wake-up to where I was on the journey. Their calm, the calm, placidly chewing cows gradually started to become a prayer. Like work, like a wheelbarrow, or a baby, their presence gave meaning to confusion. The night before the memorial celebration, I made 150 meatballs. The images of the cows kept flashing through my mind as I molded the ground beef. All cows are sacred. All meals are sacred. They are just two different ways to pray. Thank you. I wanted to share with you my favorite book of my mother's. My mother, Norma Farber, was a poet. And when she became a grandmother, she started writing children's books publishing over 20 in her lifetime, and since then my brother Tom has published other manuscripts of hers. My favorite book is How Does It Feel to Be Old, published in 1979 when she was 70, and I am 70 now. And uh, her name was Norma Farber. And the illustrations in this book are by Trina Shard Hyman, who passed away a couple of years ago. I'm going to read you just a little bit from the beginning and uh, then the last couple of pages, because there's no time to read all of it. Uh, the title is in response to a question from a granddaughter to her grandmother, how does it feel to be old? How does it feel to be old? Quite brave, quite bold. I say what I choose, having nothing to lose. By being a demon, taking a chance, no punishment. I can afford to be mean, cranky and mean, ranting and raving. I've nothing to get, no kiss, no reward for proper behaving. I come, I go, as though, as though nobody cared if I came or went. I'll scream if I will, and still and yet, nobody's made me cry in years. I miss the hug coming after the tears. And I had skipped the first page, so here's the first page. How does it feel to be old? Very nice. 
I don't have to listen to parents' advice, such as watch where you step, don't slip on the ice, come in from the cold, take off your rubbers, now tie your shoe. Nobody's telling me what to do. If somebody does, I just don't I hear. Do I make myself clear? I please myself, make my own choice. Sometimes I miss my mother's voice and my father's way so tall, so grand, of taking me firmly by the hand. Nobody's telling me. All the same, I'd like to be called by my childhood name. And this is from the latter part of the book. How does it feel to be old, in a rush, so much to be done, so few more years in which to do? It's hard to remember I once had all the time in the world to go up and down and around the world, travel to places great and small, continents near and countries far, China and Chinatown, Arctic tundra, Australian bush, the Amazon and Zanzibar. If I were five or even ten, I could live my life all over again, but I'm not and I can't and I'm going to just live out the rest that there is as I must. How does it feel to be old? Quite late. There's somewhere I'm getting to soon. I haven't been told, not school, not a playground, nor a house of a friend, not the moon. Wherever it is, I'll open a gate I'll be coming to at last, to an end or a start. I'm not quite clear. I'll end what I've loved to be doing on earth, my life right here, since the day I was slapped on my bottom at birth. I'll finish my now and my here. Remember the stories I told you, my dear, and nothing surprising can come of the fact. Have you noticed I'm shorter almost than you? I'm shrinking. You're stretching. What else is new? Well, sun keeps rising. Journets of planets continue exact. Wind keeps blowing. Sky stays wide. Soon you'll be knowing that grandma has died while you are still growing in inches and pride. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you who came out and shared your talents of poetry and song at Open Mic today. Thank you, audience, for being here from all different parts. Thank you to our three special guest features today, John Swenson, Gertrude Halstead, and John Hodgen. One more time. <laughs> Don't shut me out I am your neighbor I am your brother I am your friend Look here in my eyes You see no danger We won't be strangers In the end Come take my hand Come and make a stand with me Hear the outcries, hear the calls, bring your heart, bring your soul and we'll break down the barriers, tear down the walls. I am like you, I'm from the heavens, we are the present, we have one name, 